sorry about that. We had a little bit of audio issues. Um, so I'm going to start over here really quickly. Um, we just want to thank you again for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission today and attending this webinar. My name is Chrisinda and my colleague Lori and I are managing this session and we're fortunate to be joined here today by Courtney Colley, the agency's CWD communication specialist and she's here to talk a little bit about chronic wasting disease in Pennsylvania. We expect the presentation to last about 20 minutes and we'll have about a 10 to 15 minute question and answer period after after that, you can ask us any question by typing into the type question here box that's on the GoToWebinar control panel at the right of your screen. For those of you dialing in to listen by phone today, we just want to remind you that this is not a toll-free call and you may receive a long-distance charge from your service provider. So again, without any further ado, I want to turn this back over to Courtney. Thanks for joining us today. She's going to share a little bit about her background and herself before we get started. And here's Courtney. All right, I would first like to welcome everybody who's listening in, and again, thank you for your patience. Um, as Chrisinda said, my name is Courtney Colley, and I am the CWD Communications Specialist for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. For anyone interested, uh, I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of background information about myself for you. I grew up on a small family farm in South Central Pennsylvania, where I spent the majority of my time out of school in the field. I started hunting around the age of 15 with my father, and hunting has become a yearly obsession ever since. Um, not just deer, but a variety of things, bear and dove. Over the years, my love for the outdoors and wildlife grew so much that I decided to pursue a career in wildlife. To make a long story short, I got my master's degree in biology in 2015, and I applied for this position because, like many of you, I am concerned about CWD and the effects it could have not only on our deer herd, but also the tradition of hunting. So let's start learning a little bit about CWD. There it goes. Okay. So chronic wasting disease, or more commonly referred to as CWD, is a type of transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, which, as you can imagine, is a mouthful, so we more commonly refer to those as TSC diseases. If we break this down a little bit, uh, the T, transmissible um, or contagious, so that means that it is, uh, can be spread from animal to animal. The S, or spongiform, stands for um, the holes that CWD creates in the brain, and the E stands for encephalopathy, which means affecting the brain. TSC diseases are characterized by the holes they create in the brain, as well as having long incubation periods. The causative agent or pathogen of CWD is a prion, and we'll talk more about prions in a couple of slides here. Some other types of TSC diseases that you may have heard of before include bovine spongy and form encephalopathy, or more commonly referred to as mad cow disease. Mad cow disease was first confirmed in Great Britain in the 1980s after cows were fed meat and bone meal believed to be infected with scrapie. Scrapie then is the TSC disease that is commonly found in sheep, and it's called that because as you look at the center picture there in the bottom, right here, all right, you can see that they scrape their wool off of the back of their legs. Um, this disease was first identified in the late 1700s. Human versions of TSC diseases do exist, and creutzfeldt jakobs disease is one of those examples. CBD affects cervids, including moose, elk, caribou, and deer. To date, CWD has not been found to infect humans. Prion is an abbreviation for proteinaceous infectious particle, meaning it is a protein. Proteins are not living organisms. They're not a virus. They're not a bacteria or a fungus. Um, so since they're not living, this makes them hard to kill. Prions accumulate in the central nervous system but can be found anywhere in the body. To date, the function of prions has not been 100% confirmed. It's important to know that everyone has prions, including you. However, when in their natural shape in the body, they do not cause any harm. But when folded abnormally, these prions create holes in the brain that eventually lead to death. So you can see at the bottom right-hand corner there, um, that picture, it shows you the normal shape of a prion and then what it looks like when it folds abnormally. 
So how does this work? <clears throat> As prions accumulate in the brain, they begin to cause tissue damage, eventually leading to holes in the brain. Once the once in the body, this prion contacts other proteins around it and convinces them to mimic its abnormal shape. The newly created protein then does the same thing to the proteins around it, and so on and so forth. It's kind of like a domino effect as it slowly spreads through the body. So this picture here on the left is basically showing that spongiform state or the progression of CWD in the brain. So if you look at the bottom picture on the left, all right, this is a, a slide of normal brain tissue. This is what it looks like. As you progress upwards, you can see these holes starting to form in the brain. This would be a beginning stage of a prion disease. And as we get further, um, you can see there's a lot more holes. And, and that is representing that spongiosporm state that we've been talking about. CWD has a long incubation period, which basically means it can take a long time for symptoms to show. On average, it can take 18 to 24 months for a deer to show symptoms. This means that a deer can look perfectly healthy and be infected with CWD, like this guy right here on the left. The symptoms of CWD include lowered ears, droopy head, excessive salivation, urination and thirst, wasting or a lot of weight loss, rough coat, and behavioral changes. Some behavioral changes that are reported include the loss of weariness of humans or lack of energy. Please note, however, that many other deer diseases have similar symptoms as chronic wasting disease. So you cannot diagnose CWD alone by just looking at the animal. For instance, this deer here, uh, is showing symptoms of CWD, but it may not be infected with CWD. It could simply have a brain abscess. So how do you detect CWD? To positively diagnose CWD, tests must be done on samples of the brain and specific lymph nodes in the head. Because part of the brain must be removed for testing, the animal must be dead prior to sampling. Currently, there is no approved live test for CWD. Live test, live sampling methods are being developed, however. Examples include a rectal mucosal biopsy as well as a tonsil biopsy. Um, so hopefully we will have some tests in, in the future that we will be able to use on live animals. CWD can be transmitted directly through animal-to-animal -animal contact or indirectly through a contaminated environment. CWD prions can be shed through bodily fluids such as saliva or urine and also the feces. Once on the landscape, CWD can remain infectious in the soil for several years. As a side note, these prions are very resilient proteins. They have been found to withstand temperatures reaching 1100 degrees Fahrenheit as well as freezing and thawing. So basically, you're not going to burn this out of your deer meat, okay? Uh, transmission from mother to offspring or vertical transmission is possible. However, we do not know to what extent this occurs. CWD was first confirmed in a captive deer facility in Colorado in 1967. And it wasn't found in the wild deer population until the 1980s. CWD stayed close to that endemic area until the 1990s when CWD was first detected in Canada, infecting a captive elk farm in Saskatchewan. CWD is currently confirmed in 25 states and three Canadian provinces. So if you look at this map from the USGS, um, they keep this map fairly updated. This map is from July of 2018. Um, the dark gray area here in the center, that represents the endemic area CBD, where it was first found, as far as we know. So um, that would represent that endemic area. The other gray areas on the map represent areas where CBD has been found in our wild populations. The dots on the map represent areas where CBD has been found in captive facilities. The yellow are areas that have been depopulated, while the red are areas that have not been depopulated yet. So you can see that Pennsylvania does still have a couple of facilities that have not been depopulated.
CWD was first confirmed in Pennsylvania in 2012 at a captive deer farm in Adams County. Shortly after, three positives were found in the wild population in Bedford and Blair counties. Um, there's a lot of debate about how CWD came into Pennsylvania. How did it exactly get here? Um, whether it came through the wild deer herd, whether a hunter put it in the back of his truck and brought it here um, from another state, or whether it came through the captive deer industry. And honestly, we cannot answer that question. Um, either way, however, it is in our state, it is in Pennsylvania, and what we really need to focus on now is putting our efforts together in controlling it and preventing it spread further. Due to these 2012 positives that we found, disease management areas 1 and 2 were created in which certain regulations apply to help reduce the risk of spreading chronic wasting disease. So what is a disease management area? Well, when a new positive is found, a 10 mile radius buffer is established around the confirmation site. This buffer is the foundation for the disease management area. In areas where CWD is present, a new positive is detected. The buffer might fall within the existing DMA and if it's within, completely covered already within that DMA, no changes to the boundary would need to occur. However, if the buffer falls outside of the DMA, so if it would be out in this area, or if it's on the edge of the existing DMA, then that DMA is expanded or a new DMA is created. DMA boundaries follow easily identifiable marking sense as roadways or rivers. Therefore, the buffer may sometimes fall outside or slightly inside of this 10 mile radius. The reason we picked a 10 mile radius is because on average, a deer's home range is about one square mile. Deer will sometimes travel outside of this home range to look for mates or to find food. However, most will not travel more than 10 miles outside of their home range. Therefore, the buffer is set at a 10 mile radius. There are currently three active DMAs in Pennsylvania. You may have noticed that DMA-1 is not on the map. It would have been located to the right of Adams County there, right in about this area. This is because DMA was dissolved in 2017 after more than 4,600 deer were tested and over five years, I should say, and no positives came back. If a DMA has no additional positives for five consecutive years, it can be dissolved. Please note that dissolved does not mean that that area is 100% CWD free. It just means we haven't found it there for five years. So testing and surveillance still occur within that area to monitor CWD. DMA2 originally covered about 900 square miles in the Bedford and Blair County area, but it now covers a little over 4,600 square miles, reaching parts of 12 counties in the south central part of the state. Since 2012, 153 wild deer have tested positive for CWD. It's important to note that DMA expansions are not only due to Pennsylvania positives alone. What I'm trying to say by this is that if a CWD positive deer is detected within 10 miles of the Pennsylvania border, so like in Maryland, for instance, a DMA will be established within the state of Pennsylvania to ensure that 10 mile buffer exists from that confirmation site. So if we would have a positive that would exist right here, a buffer would then have to be made in this area um, in the state of Pennsylvania. Disease Management Area 3 was established in 2014 after CWD was detected on two different captive facilities in Jefferson County. And it wasn't found in the free-ranging population until 2017 when we detected three positives um, within or near the DMA. Uh, so as a result, DMA 3 was expanded. It currently covers about 2,400 square miles, and it reaches parts of Jefferson, Indiana, Clearfield, Cambria, Armstrong, and Clarion counties. Disease Management Area 4 was established in February of this year 
after the detection of a CWD positive deer in a captive facility in Lancaster County. The DMA currently covers about 346 square miles and it reaches parts of Lancaster, Lebanon, and Berks County. To date, no positives have been found in the wild population in Disease Management Area 4. So, the Pennsylvania Game Commission began CWD surveillance in 2002, long before it was detected in our state. Since 2002, the Pennsylvania Game Commission has sampled over 70,000 deer. The goals of surveillance are to monitor CWD within these DMAs, as well as detect new cases of CWD outside of the DMA area, so within the entire state. Surveillance efforts include hunter harvested deer or elk, and to increase surveillance efforts, the Pennsylvania Game Commission offers free CWD testing for deer harvested within the DMA. So if you're hunting within the DMA, you can get your deer tested for free. Some deer harvested by hunters and taken to deer processors within these DMAs and outside of the DMAs are also sampled for the disease. All hunter harvested elk are tested as well. To date, there have been no positives among Pennsylvania's elk herd. We also test all road killed deer within the DMAs and all escaped captive deer or elk that can be captured are tested for CWD. So if you see a deer or an elk with a tag in its ear, um, please contact the Pennsylvania Game Commission. We also test clinical subjects, um, with, or suspects, sorry. Um, this would be deer or elk that are displaying symptoms of CWD. So if you see a sick deer or elk, um, please contact your local regional office or the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Now I keep saying that there are special rules and regulations that apply within these disease management areas. Within a disease management area, it is unlawful to expo export high-risk deer parts from a DMA. The importance of this regulation is to prevent people from dumping high-risk parts on the landscape in uninfected areas and possibly contaminate the environment there or expose a deer or elk that is uninfected to this disease. Often we get questions about people who want to transport their deer from one disease management area to another or from the DMA straight to a processor outside of that DMA. According to regulation, it is unlawful for anyone to transport the high-risk parts out of the DMA. There are some approved exceptions. For instance, if a processor or a taxidermist within five miles of the disease management area boundary agrees to and takes the proper training, whole carcasses may be taken directly to them despite being outside of the DMA. For a list of cooperating processors and taxidermists, refer to our webpage. It is unlawful to use urine-based attractants within the DMA. And in addition, it is also unlawful to feed wild deer within a disease management area. This also includes the use of mineral licks. This ban was put in place to help reduce the unnatural congregation of deer. As stated earlier, prions can shed in the saliva, feces, and urine. Therefore, congregating deer can increase the risk of spreading this disease. So what are these high-risk parts? The high-risk parts include the brain, eyes, tonsils, lymph nodes, spinal cord, and spleen. You can see those highlighted in red on the deer on the lower right. These parts are considered high-risk because prions tend to concentrate in high densities in these locations. Once again, these parts cannot be exported outside of a disease management area or imported into Pennsylvania from a CWD positive state. So as stated earlier, there are 25 CWD positive states in the United States. Once the high-risk parts are removed, 
the remaining meat, such as the front quarters, the hind quarters, the back straps, etc., can be transported throughout the state. So one of the questions I commonly get is, what if I get a really nice buck and I want the antlers or I want to get it mounted? So what are your options? One thing that should be noted is that you can take your deer, whole carcass, to any processor or taxidermist within the disease management area or within the CWD positive state in which your harvest was taken in. So that is one option. Another option, if you want your deer mounted, is to take your deer to a processor within the disease management area or CWD positive state you hunted in and have them caped and quartered for you. Then you can take your cape to get it mounted at a taxidermist of your choice because those high risk parts are now removed. Same thing goes for if you have a particular processor who's bologna or pepper sticks, you just must have, okay? You can always take it to a processor within the DMA or CWD positive state first to get it quartered and have those high risk parts removed and then take your meat to your preferred processor. Another option is to remove the high risk parts yourself in the field within the disease management area or CWD positive state you hunted in. Once these parts are removed, then you can go get it mounted or processed further at a location of your choosing. If you don't want to get your deer mounted, but you do want the antlers, you can cap the skull with a traditional V-cut. Just make sure that all the visible brain matter is removed from the skull plate prior to leaving the DMA or CWD positive state. The main thing to remember here is that you got to remove those high risk parts prior to leaving the disease management area or CWD positive state that you're hunting in. Okay. So I just told you, you got to remove all these high risk parts. Now, what do you do with them? What are your options for disposal? The high risk parts can be left at the location of the kill site. Um, personally, this is not one of my preferred options. Um, if you choose to leave your high risk parts at the location of the kill site, we recommend that you bury those parts um, just to make it a little bit harder for an uninfected deer to encounter them or for a scavenger to pick them up and run off with them. High risk parts can also be disposed with your regular tra household trash um, and sent to a lined landfill. So this is if you're within the DMA. You can double bag your high-risk parts and put them out um, for your commercial trash service to pick them up. Okay. And also, within a disease management area, you can dispose of your high-risk parts in our high-risk parts collection containers that are provided by the Game Commission. In order to do this, please double bag the high-risk parts prior to doing so, and the location of these containers is found on the Game Commission website. Something else that is important to note is that within disease management areas in Pennsylvania, you can get your deer tested for free. Double bag your deer head and ensure that the harvest tag is complete and attached to the ear. You then place the deer head in a head collection container provided by the Game Commission. So they look like these, so kind of like the clothing collection bins that you see um, out and about. So um, they will say free testing and chronic wasting disease on them. And again, the location of those can be found on our website. Results typically take about four to six weeks. Um, while CWD has not been found to infect humans, it is recommended that you do not eat the meat until you receive the results. If your deer comes back positive, you may give up your infected meat to the Game Commission in exchange for another deer tag. However, the same regulations apply to this deer tag, meaning you must use it within the appropriate hunting seasons. Once outside, uh, or for people outside of the DMA, um, you can get your deer tested at the Pennsylvania Veterinary Laboratory in Harrisburg. Um, but it comes with a fee. I believe last year it was about $75 to get your deer tested outside of the DMA. Uh, more information on that can be found on the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's website. Okay, so I hope this presentation was informative and helped you gain a better understanding of CWD. I am more than happy to take any questions that you have. And if you do have questions, please send them to the link below. Um, 
since we are a little bit short on time or limited on time, if I don't get to your questions now, um, I will respond to your questions via email as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. So we had a question. Um, if there is any evidence of CBD being found in northeastern Pennsylvania. So in what we consider our northeast region, um, uh, management region, so far there has not been any CWD found in, in those counties. Um, so the northeast region of Pennsylvania is about one of the only regions in Pennsylvania that has still been considered safe. Uh, the areas that it is found in Pennsylvania, let's go back to that if I can find that page here. You can see it. There we go. All right. So this northeastern uh, corner here, it's it's pretty clear. The closest uh, positive that you guys would have had was in disease management area four, and there's no wild positives in that disease management area. It's all been in the captive deer industry. Um, so you guys are, are pretty uh, okay. It's very low risk. Okay, so another question. What precautions should auto body personnel take when repairing vehicles involved in deer collisions? This is a really good question, and I appreciate whoever asked this question. So anytime you're handling a, a deer, deer parts, uh, we always recommend that you wear latex or, or some form of glove, right? That helps just prevent uh, passing for, for one, just any bacteria that that deer might have to you, and it's also another barrier to help protect you from exposure to CWD. Um, if it is with a, an auto body accident, then there's a possibility that that spinal cord fluid or brain fluid could be exposed. Try avoiding, avoid touching this directly at any cost, you know, um, and try not to you know, rub your eyes or anything like that after you are handling these deer. I would highly recommend um, cleaning anything with a 50-50 bleach water solution for an hour um, afterwards. Anything that has, you know, uh, any of your tools that might have touched it, okay, um, as well as make sure you wash your hands thoroughly. Okay, so um, just take precautions, and a lot of these precautions should be taken anyway, whether you're in a, a disease management area or not. Um, CWD is not the only thing that deer carry, um, or wild animals for that, so anytime you're dealing with the parts of a wild animal, you should really take a lot of these precautions. Um, so, where do I find the map of disease management areas? Um, so, if you go to the Pennsylvania Game Commission webpage, um, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom and on the right, there is a link for CWD on there. If you click that webpage there, it'll, it'll load our CWD page, and it's going to have a ton of information for you um, on CWD, all right? Um, in that, there is an uh, interactive map that you can go into and zoom into any of those areas. It's really nice because, let's say, um, you're hunting in, in this area here and you're not familiar with the boundary. You can zoom right into that area nice and close and see all the roadways and, and everything right in that area. Now, uh, for people who do not have access to the internet, um, it is still in our, our digest, so you can get those boundaries in our Hunter Digest each year. And um, if you go to any of our CWD public meetings, um, off, I am often there handing out a lot of these maps, so they are available through that as well. Um, I'm hoping to get some maps uh, into some issuing agents if they're willing to take them. Uh, so they're, we're working on get them, getting them out to people who do not have internet access as well. Okay. Okay, so I like this question. Um, can my dog get CWD from eating deer droppings? So uh, there have been some studies that have been done here recently on whether scavengers 
can get CWD um, from eating infected meat or, you know, deer, deer droppings would be similar in that category. Um, so what they are being, being kind of uh, trying to determine is whether those prions can remain infectious after they are consumed and go the whole way through the digestive system and basically are then shed back on the environment. Um, they don't really know what's the possibility of those animals actually um, carrying and shedding and how infectious it is after it goes through the entire digestive system. However, to date, um, CWD has not been known to infect canines. Um, so they may be able to pass it through their, their system and spread it further, uh, but it does not appear to infect them or affect um, their health in any way. So your deer should, I mean, so your dog should be safe. All right, we have a couple other questions. We have a few questions about EHD, and we're going to pass those along to our wildlife veterinarian. So if you would like to email um, PGC comments at pa.gov with those EHD questions, we will pass them on to a different staff member. And we also have questions about getting copies of the PowerPoint. The, it is being recorded, so you will receive a link to the recording um, within the next couple days, so you'll get it that way. And then we'll have just a couple more questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, um, so we'll make sure uh, that you can see that link again to email us with the questions, and Courtney will tackle them that way. Yes, all right, I will. All right, all right so... Why do you believe that the first CWD detections within a DMA were always on game farms? So, there's a couple of reasons why this could be. Um, I will say, though, um, Disease Management Area 2, their first CWD positive cases were actually in wild populations. So, it's not so much that every single one did come first from a captive deer facility. Um, however, a large majority of them do. Um, this could be for a variety of reasons. Um, Deer farms are, you know, a, a smaller area, and those animals are contained in them. Um, animals that are deer farms, I should say, are required right now by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture to either be in what's called a herd monitoring program or a herd certification program, in which either 50% of their deer that die have to be tested or 100% of their deer that die have to be tested. So... In Pennsylvania, in our wild herd, we estimate we have a little bit over um, about 1.5 million deer. That's a lot of deer to test. There's it, it, there's no way we're ever going to be able to test, you know, 50% to 100% of our deer. Uh, we, we don't have resources for that. Um, so within those deer farms, they're testing a higher percentage of the deer. So you might have a better ability of finding a positive which within an area where you, you have higher testing. Um, last year the Pennsylvania Game Commission tested uh, about uh, 7,900 deer um, in 2017. So we are testing a, a good number of deer in the state. It's just we can't reach uh, quite high levels. As you can imagine a deer that's uh, within an enclosure is probably a little bit easier to catch uh, and it's dead to test than us finding them out in the wild. Um, so, so there's kind of uh, a, a difference in, in uh, testing ability. Uh, so the next question, is there an effort to make it easier to test hunter harvested deer outside the DMAs? We would love to make it you know, uh, available for people to test their deer. Um, currently, however, the reason we have these testing locations within our DMAs is actually for surveillance purposes first. So we place these head collection containers in areas where um, we're specifically interested in increasing the amount of samples that we need. Uh, so whether it's in a new area where we got a new CWD positive where we're really interested in seeing what is the prevalence within that area or it, just a focus area where it seems that we're getting a lot of positives. So we put those in there because we would like to have extra samples in those areas. Um, to test outside of the DMAs, like I said, you can call um, the Pennsylvania Veterinary Laboratory and set up something with them where they will test your deer. 
Um, unfortunately, though, uh, the Game Commission currently cannot afford to pay for all deer hunters to get their deer tested throughout the entire state of Pennsylvania. Um, so maybe someday, but currently we really need to focus on these areas um, where we need more information from. Maybe one more. Okay. So... Uh, so somebody asked, how do you clean field dressing knives and saws? So the best thing that um, we can tell you guys is to clean them with a 50-50 bleach and water solution um, for an hour and make sure that solution is, is pretty hot. Okay, so uh, that's the best thing that we can. And just make sure, that, of course, there's no visible high-risk parts attached, attached to your knives and saws. Uh, when you are field dressing your deer, we recommend that you avoid cutting through the spinal cord and also try and avoid being exposed to any of that um, brain or spinal cord fluid. All right, everybody. Um, unfortunately, it looks like we are just about out of time, and we're sorry uh, if we weren't able to get to your question today. But as Courtney said, you can email us at PGC Comments. Um, we'll put that uh, email address back up on your screen, and we'll get back to you. This has definitely been a great session with a lot of important information and great questions. Um, this has been recorded and you'll receive an email with a link to the recording within the next few days. The recording is also going to be uploaded to the Game Commission's YouTube channel, where captions will be auto-loaded and edited for you to view. Uh, again, I'd just like to thank Courtney for sharing her, expect her expertise and for her time with us today. And we'd also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon. And we hope that you'll visit us again to learn more about Pennsylvania wildlife in upcoming webinars. Let us know what subjects you'd be interested in learning more about. You can email them to us as well. But until then, we hope you're able to get outside and enjoy some of Pennsylvania's great outdoors. Thank you.